I was going to attend a Halloween celebration at my sister's house after work. She lived quite far from me. The shortest way to get to her house was by traveling the subway car, which takes 20 minutes to reach. The nearest subway station to my workplace was at 10 minutes walking distance. I arranged my schedule accordingly that day, planning that if I leave at 6.30 p.m., I will easily reach her house by 7, 7.15 p.m. I didn't want to be late, but as usual, life doesn't work according to plans all the time. The moment when I was just about to leave, my boss called me and handed me an important work. It's only been three months since I have joined this new office, so there was no way I could have given any excuse to my boss. With a sad face, I again unpacked my bag and started to work. The office only had our security guard on the ground floor, and everyone else left early that day. I managed to finish my work by 7.45 p.m., and I calculated that if I hurry up, I can still catch the 8 p.m. subway car. I quickly packed my bags and rushed towards the metro station. My sister called me, and as I took her call to tell her that I was on my way, my phone lost its signal. I realized that it is because I have entered the subway station. The station was completely empty. I checked the arrival time of the next train, and with relief, I saw that I have made it. I didn't have to wait long as the train came at 8 p.m. sharp and I got on it. The berth that I was in had no one. I sat down on the left side aisle facing the opposite side of the train so that I could see the platforms passing by. I put on my earplugs to listen to some music as I was going to get off in the 8th station. My eyes were on the window just when. I felt there's someone else inside this train with me. I looked around and saw a man sitting on the right side facing me. He was sitting at a distance, but I could see him clearly. He wore an old suit of faded brown color with surprisingly white pants. He was at first looking outside the window, but then he turned back at me and smiled in a very creepy way. His smile was so big that it almost spread from one ear to another. I thought to myself, there was no one else present on the platform. The train hasn't reached the next station yet. Then how come he got inside? My mind was going through a lot of confusion as I started to feel uncomfortable with this guy alone in a subway car at Halloween night. The train was decorated with fake cobwebs and little lights for Halloween. I shifted my eyes towards the decoration and decided to ignore this man. I hope he will get off before me. The next station arrived, but the man didn't get off. I thought to check my phone in case it has got a signal so I could call my sister. I was going through my phone just when the man made a very creepy move. He turned towards me and said in a husky voice, if you want, you can use my phone. It has a signal. I was pretty sure that we were in an underground subway, so there's no way phones can get a signal here. I awkwardly smiled and said, no thanks, my stop will come in some time. The man seemed a bit disheartened with my refusal. He then stood up and said, why aren't a pretty thing like you celebrating on Halloween night? I felt really offensive with his exaggerated comments. I stood up and replied in a loud voice. Look, mister, I don't know you, so stop harassing me or I'll call the emergency number on the subway car. Also, there are security cameras inside the car, you know. The man looked startled with my words and moved his eyes back to the window. At the fifth station, an old woman got into the subway car which gave me some air of relief. She looked at the man and then looked at me. Maybe she guessed something and came to sit beside me. I thanked her for a kind gesture by smiling at her. It was going all well, but the woman got down the next station and again, the fear of being alone with this creepy stranger acquired my heart. I realized I was just two stations away, so I got up and went to stand near the door. I wanted to get off as soon as I can. After a few seconds, the man also got up and came towards me. I faced my back towards him, but I could see him standing behind me on the glass door of the subway car. Suddenly, I heard his heavy breath very close to my ear, and my heart froze in fear. I noticed on the glass door that he was smelling my hair. His nostrils were becoming big as he inhaled the smell of my ear while exhaling the warm air by his mouth. I could tell he was drunk by the smell of his mouth. 
I wanted to teach that guy a lesson, but I'm a short, lean man, and the only thing I had on my hand was my backpack, which wasn't enough for protection. I was numb with fear and terror. I could barely move. The only option I had is to wait for my platform. So I gathered all my courage and stood there silently. I was waiting for the door to open and was all set to run for my life. The train started to enter the platform just when the man whispered into my ears. Happy Halloween, little birdie. Now fly away. The door opened just then and without looking behind, I ran as fast as I could. Once I reached my sister's house, I broke into tears. My family calmed me down and I somehow managed myself that night. A few days later, I was sitting at my house watching TV when a news flashed into the screen. I saw that same guy being arrested by the cops from a subway station. The news revealed that he was a murderer who broke out of prison the night before Halloween. He was found by a patrolling officer in the middle of the night, throwing an unconscious girl on the railway track. The officer called for backup and stopped him right then. They somehow managed to save the girl, but she was found with a serious head injury. The man supposedly hit her from behind and wanted her to get crushed by an upcoming subway car. The man has been sent to a mental institution for his lifetime. I couldn't take the subway rides for three months after this incident. I am terrified to walk alone at night, even though I know that guy can never hurt me again. But the only thing that makes me question is, why did he let me get away that night? Even in my dreams, I hear him whisper in my ears, fly away, little birdie, fly. Ghosts are not the only thing that can make your Halloween night a horrible experience for your entire life. Timothy applied glue to his forehead and a little under his chin in order to secure his mask. He'd be a monster, a hideous troll, hideous enough to conceal his real identity. He'd been struck with morphia, a rare condition which, with time, mutates skin and in severe cases, even bone. He was now 13 and the disease made him look like a monster, worse than the mask that he would hide behind. He watched himself in the bathroom mirror as he carefully applied the fake green hair, then the mask. He'd worn the mask each Halloween for the last three years and was looking forward to again being a regular kid for that one night. This was the only time he could disguise himself. The other kids couldn't tell that there was anything abnormal or disgusting under the mask. For this one night, he could avoid their frightened looks and cruel laughter. So Timothy went out on his own, even though his mother would not have wanted it. It was a cool night in Haleyville. Maple leaves had turned the fiery crimson yellow of Indian summer. It had rained earlier that day, sticking wet, multicolored leaves to the sidewalk. At dusk, carefree goons and goblins splashed through puddles of idle rainwater, running to ring doorbells. They zeroed in on houses decorated with lighted styrofoam gravestones or plastic black cats. These promised to deliver goodies after yelling, Trick or treat! Timothy the monster followed three or four smaller kids to a house that featured flashing lightning and a cackling witch on the porch. As he cautiously stepped up to the door, a hobo kid ran right into him, almost knocking him over. They both tried for the bell, but the monster won out. As the door opened, they yelled, Trick or treat! Trick or treat! Only one candy each was carefully dropped into their bags. A little dismayed, they walked back to the sidewalk together. Hobo exclaimed, I like it better when they let you pick the ones you want, don't you? There were some Snickers in there. I guess they're saving those for someone else, said Monster. Hobo suddenly recalled, Hey, I know a house where they got candy apples. Let's go, said Monster. Hobo paused. Hey, what's your name anyway? Timothy sighed. Monster. No, your real name, Dodo. My friends call me Tim. He really hadn't had any friends, but it sounded good to say it that way. My name's Sean. I live on Baker. Hey, let's get going before all the candy apples are gone. Okay, replied Monster, and together they ran down the darkening street. Before they got to the apple house, they bumped into Sean's other friends. There was Bobby as a scruffy Davy Crockett, Arnold was Wolfman, and Superman, whose real name was Jimmy, Lance dressed as Dracula. This is my new friend Tim, said Hobo. 
but you can call him Monster. We're going to get some candy apples. Want to come? Just been there. They're all out, Wolfman disappointingly reported. Dracula came running up to the boy, sweaty and out of breath. There was this car full of teenagers. I, I threw an egg and it splattered all over the windshield. Suddenly came the sound of screeching tires as the car whipped around the corner. Oh shit, here they come! The blue car screeched to a stop. All four doors burst open. Four seniors, some wearing leather jackets, rushed towards the boys. The superheroes scattered. They caught Davy Crockett by the arm and waved a tire iron in his face, threatening to brain whoever threw the egg. Davy cleverly let a fresh one that he was holding behind his back slip from his hand, where it luckily fell into a low hedge. As the teenagers were sure they had thoroughly intimidated the younger boys, the driver yelled from the car, Hey guys, let's go! Leave these little pucks alone! And just as fast as it had come, the blue hot rod burned rubber and was gone. That was close, whispered a relieved Superman. Then came the third degree. Dracula started asking Monster some uncomfortable questions. So what school you go to? What grade you in? Where do you live? Then Monster made an unforced error. Maple Street. I live on Maple Street. Why? Wolfman questioned. Is that where that really creepy guy lives? On Maple? My sister said she saw him once in his backyard. Scared her stiff. She ran all the way home. It was a real monster, she said. Dracula, seeing an opportunity for more mischief, retorted. Hey guys, let's go over to the monster house and egg it. Hobo intuitively shook his head. No, I don't think that's a good idea. What, little hobo scared? Taunted Wolfman. Dracula joined in. It's Halloween, man. We got some treats. Let's do some tricks. Yeah, yeah let's, let's go. go. They agreed. That is, except hobo and monster. Outvoted, they followed along as they all walked toward the monster house. They only had a short way to go. Just around the corner to Elm, then Maple. There were no street lamps on the block. Except for the pale amber light of a half moon and a lone jack-o'-lantern on the porch, the monster house was eerily dark. The superhero silently stood there for a moment. Is that it? Superman whispered. Although the house itself was just about the same as all the other houses on the block, Davy Crockett exclaimed, Looks kind of creepy, doesn't it? Are you sure that's where the monster lives? Dracula questioned. Wolfman eagerly bellowed. Where's the eggs? Hobo tried to stop it before it started. We might get in trouble, he hesitated. Dracula sarcastically chided. We might get in trouble, we might get in trouble. Then he threw the first egg, hitting the front door. Cool, exclaimed Superman. Give me one. On that dark Halloween night, there was suddenly the wild frenzy of flying eggs, then the stomping of the jack o lantern Timothy saw the maddened glee in their eyes as they chanted. Monster monster monster, 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 monster. Stop! He cried out. Stop it! He pushed Dracula. Dracula pushed back. They tussled to the ground, punching, kicking, and yelling. Then the unthinkable happened. Timothy's mask came off. In the dim light, his face looked even worse than it really was. There was a collective gasp at the monster he'd been hiding all along. Stepping back in shock and disgust, someone called out. Oh my god, it's the monster! Their collective jaws dropped. Their eyes now were wide open in shock. Hobo knelt to the ground by the friendly monster's side, who was by then completely humiliated. That's enough, demanded Hobo. Leave him alone. Over with the initial scare, Davy Crockett giggled. <laughs> Everyone except Hobo was uncontrollably laughing at the hideous monster that just moments before had been a regular kid. Suddenly, lights went on in the house. Timothy's mother opened the front door. Wolfman shouted, Let's get out of here! And the giggling gang quickly escaped around the corner. That Halloween had turned into Timothy's worst nightmare. Once again, he'd been laughed at and humiliated. But out of that humiliation, he found a friend. He remembered what his mother had told him. You'll know who your true friends are, especially in your darkest hour. Hobo Sean finally asked, So will you ever get better? Timothy explained what Morphia was and that within a few years it was expected to run its course and he'd be just fine. As they grew up together, where one was, so was the other. 
They were college roommates, best man at each other's weddings, and lifelong friends. Over the years, they shared countless laughs remembering the scared looks on those boys' faces that Halloween. Sean became a doctor of rare diseases. Ironically, Timothy became a writer of horror novels. It's been over 40 years. They both have wonderful lives. That was the night Timothy found his best friend. It happened just that way. I know. I was monster.